Um, so hi everyone, uh, we're going to get started in just a second um, and very excited that, that we have Morgan Hardy here today, um, but I just wanted to go over some ground rules um, first. So welcome to the CSE Development Economics webinar. Um, we're going to have Morgan speak for about 45 minutes. Um, during this time while she's giving her presentation, um, you can ask clarifying questions and if you're in the audience, please use the Q&A function um, to type out your question and then I'll wait for, for an opportune time um, to read the question out. Um, to Morgan. Um, if you're a panelist, please raise your hand and likewise I'll, I'll call on you at an opportune time um, to, to ask your question live. Then at the end, um, after Morgan's done with her presentation, we'll have 13 minutes um, of questions and a more general discussion. And then if you're in the audience and, and you want to ask a question, I'll call on you um, and you can ask that live as well. Um, so, so please use your raise the raise your hand function um, during during that final Q and A if you want to ask a question. Um, so thank you very much um, for joining today. I'm really delighted um, to welcome uh, Morgan Hardy from um, NYU Abu Dhabi, who's going to be presenting "Gotta Have Money to Make Money: Bargaining Behavior and Financial Need of Micro Entrepreneurs." So thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Morgan. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, Great. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to thank the organizers for uh, the invitation to present this work. It's joint with uh, Gisela Kagi at Vassar College and Lena Song, who's a graduate student who will be on the market next year from NYU, New York. Um, it's the, the paper is called Gotta Have Money to Make Money, uh, Bargaining Behavior and Financial Need of Micro Entrepreneurs. And Currently, I, I'm just going to be upfront about where we are with this paper right now. So conditionally, it's, it's, it's currently conditionally accepted at uh, AER Insights. However, uh, we have kind of many suggested changes to the framing and discussion and theory. And um, we've recently made kind of substantial revisions to the originally submitted paper with regards to kind of the paper contents and the arc and the model in response to suggestions from the editors and referees toward the endeavor of um, increasing the uh, clarity and, and impact of the paper. So although you know, AER Insights only really conditionally accepts papers, if the editors feel there's a clear path to ultimate, ultimate acceptance, where there's still kind of a lot of revisions that we're trying to make with this paper to make it better um, with regards to kind of its impact and clarity. And we're really hoping that uh, this can be kind of a, a fielding ground for the the changes that we've made so far and we're really interested in any suggestions that you have uh comments or suggestions towards the goal of kind of increasing the overall quality of the paper because that's really our goal with the research and so uh with that in mind i'm going to keep my email in the bottom corner of each slide and so whether you're in the talk today or you're watching this later or you're um, you know, for, for whatever reason you're you're unable to fit your your suggestion or your comment in the during the presentation or during the the Q and A, we'd be really interested in in hearing from you because you know we're excited about this work and we want to make it um, as good as possible. So yeah, with that kind of uh, intro and and setting expectations and kind of hopefully you can kind of be on our team with with trying to make this better. We're gonna um, I'll, I'll start. So yeah, so this this paper is kind of in this. There we go. Uh, the paper's kind of in this broad uh, literature that's trying to understand, uh, you know, firms and employment in low-income countries. And, and many of you in this room work in this literature, so you might know the Zoom room. <laughs> Sorry, I work in this literature, so you so you know that you know firm productivity in low-income countries is lower on average than in rich countries, and distributed with a far thicker left tail. In particular, small firms dominate the firm size distribution and employment in low income countries. Another thing that's kind of different on average between kind of high and low income countries that kind of comes along with this firm size is how prices are set. So in rich countries, you know, a lot of firms kind of set their prices, they're, they're fixed, they're on the wall, the, the workers in the firm aren't really setting those prices, they're determined, to, you know, we know that prices are sticky. In, you know, if you go to a market in Ghana, and you're trying to buy a, a, a product, typically you are interacting uh, with the owner themselves and the price is being more or less set in, in real time. And so this is, this is kind of the, the main uh, focus of this paper. In particular, we're gonna ask this question of you know, what drives bargaining behavior of small firm owners 
and the resultant final pricing in micro enterprises. And kind of the key takeaway that, that we think we're, we're getting from the paper is we document and interpret a large and robust empirical relationship between the seller's endowment and the price of the goods uh, and services that, that they're selling. A general kind of outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. So first we're gonna show you some empirical evidence. The, the first set of empirical evidence comes from a real bargaining exercise uh, that shows a, a strong, robust relationship between measured uh, like self-reported household liquidity from a survey and the final price uh, received in a real bargaining exercise over a real child shirt order. Uh, we're gonna show this in a panel. Uh, the second set of empirical evidence that, that, we're, that we're showing in this paper is experimental. It's, it's the sign of a lab in the field experiment where we randomize a liquidity shock. We kind of randomize a high and low liquidity shock immediately before our respondents bargain over a potential surplus with a computer customer that we, that we kind of frame up as, as being uh, programmed to behave like a buyer bargaining over the price of a good. We, we see that, that same relationship in the experiment. And then finally, we kind of posit a, a possible intuition. So you don't have to really do much to kind of see this result in theory. In particular, we extend, you know, just the very classic Nash bargaining solution to include endowment and, and non-risk neutral preferences. We use CRA preferences and we see the same increasing relationship between endowment and um, surplus allocation in this kind of theoretical bargaining game. In terms of the contribution, we think of this paper as kind of making two, in between two literatures, this is probably the lesser of the two literatures, the bargaining literature, which kind of has this vast and established set of papers about bargaining theory and a similarly vast lab experimental literature um, in which often bargaining is treated as this standalone activity. They're interested in things like imperfect information, strategy, cooperative, non-cooperative, et cetera. And this abstracts away from individual and household characteristics. There's some evidence from bargaining in the field in developing countries where they've started to kind of focus on buyer characteristics and bargaining outcomes. So, you know, the gender of a, customer with respect to taxi prices, for example. I think where this paper kind of fits into this bargaining literature is we focus instead on the link between seller characteristics, in particular endowment or liquidity, and the bargaining behavior and outcomes of the seller. With respect to kind of the, the, the main literature we're hoping to contribute to, which is the literature on small firms, there's you know a, a large empirical literature that, that many of you have contributed to uh, that studies barriers to the increase in kind of firm size profits. Uh, kind of the, the biggest literature is mainly focused on capital, credit, and management. And I think within that literature, what we see is kind of the most complementary to what we're doing is this literature that's that's kind of randomizing the, the rigidity of, of loan repayment. Um, and they're testing for the impact of this kind of increased loan flexibility, which we see as a form of liquidity on um, profits or firm growth or firm owner behavior. Uh, there's also kind of just note, there's like less study barriers on kind of demand, networks, infrastructure, labor. And I think this is where this paper comes in, where we're really thinking of this new consideration within this literature on how firm owners price their goods and services. As price is a key determinant to markets and, it's a, and, and markets are a key ingredient to profits. We have a question. Yeah, um, if that's okay, Morgan, from Morgan, yeah. super, super interesting uh, topic, of course. On this slide here, are you, in terms of the magnitudes that you estimate, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. are you going to find that this is sort of economically meaningful in terms of the yes. three bullet points that you've just mentioned? Yeah, so so this is important, and this is something that we're, um, I'm going to come back to you in the conclusion, and it's actually uh, one of the comments that the editor made that we really need to comment directly on kind of closing the loop on what we're able to say about profits directly here. But what we see is a large, uh, like an economically meaningful relationship between liquidity and price. What we're less able to show, I mean, we can show it observationally, but I don't find that to be particularly convincing, a relationship between things like profits and assets and liquidity. But it's it's a little you get a little bit muddy with the you know with identification when you're trying to think about the relationship between something like liquidity and profits because we have observational liquidity in the panel 
And, um, and profits is a big part of that because most of our business owners, as you'll see when I get into the context, their primary source of income is profits and profits are obviously like your income, your own income is an important input to your, to a stock variable. So, so it's a little bit, uh, but, but where we think, uh, uh, we'll, we'll kind of later on in the, in the conclusion, I'm going to get a little bit more into kind of pontificating about my thoughts with respect to where this paper is kind of both complementing existing literature on this idea of this like poverty trap cycle and where I think future future literature needs to kind of like pick up the torch. But but yeah, I think I think that there there's economically meaningful um, you know relationships both in terms of the the causal relationships that we're able to estimate in the lab experiment as well as in the the panel data. Um, on kind of this relationship between liquidity and price, but but we aren't necessarily going to take that final leap in this paper between kind of price and profits because you need to um, you need to make assumptions about things like quantity and and cost. And so what we have is price. We don't have like the complete profit equation, and and you need to make assumptions about like market structure and and how price impacts quantity, et cetera. So. Yeah, sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but you really hit, you, you jumped right to one of the things that, that we're working on with this paper. So I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Are there any other questions before I jump into the, the details of the context? I don't see any others at this okay. point. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Guy. Okay, uh, so yeah, the, the context of this study is um, this town in the Vulture region of, of Ghana, Hohoi. It's kind of a typical uh, mid-sized district capital and we're going to be focusing in particular on on garment makers so we have kind of a full census of garment makers in this one particular town and and these are the people that um, we're going to be interacting with uh, just to kind of set you know your brains into this context uh, I know a lot of you study kind of similar contexts in in other uh, and, and similar samples so so uh, these garment makers you know are similar to other kinds of micro enterprises or industries in other low-income countries. Their monthly profits are around uh, 50 US dollars at the time of the study. Uh, these firms are small in scale. They typically have few to no paid employees besides the owner. Uh, the owners are both genders. We have about 75% uh, female. They use a simple production technology. As you can see, this is an example of a, a manual sewing machine. Many of them also have electric sewing machines, but, but the primary input is the owner's labor. Uh, itself. Uh, these firms are kind of numerous. They produce uh, similar products. Uh, the demand comes from the local population. Uh, garments are made to order. So the buyer typically provides the fabric and the materials and then, you know, the, the um, owner is paid on the receipt of the, the garment. And I think the key detail for this context is that similar to a lot of other um, low income country firm owners, they sell uh, the, the sellers and the buyers, they haggle over the price of the garment. Uh, the, the data collection activity, the primary data collection activity for this project came from a class that I teach at NYU, where every year in January, with the exception of this year because of the pandemic, we, um, we take uh, some NYU undergraduates to Ghana to teach them, to introduce them to development economics. So it's kind of a crash course in development, crash course in development economics. The students have come in with, with no background in development, they've never opened SETA, et cetera. And we take them through this intensive three weeks where they kind of read about, read about basic um, uh, kind of topics in development. We take them to the field, they shadow surveyors in an actual research study, which is the one that I'm presenting you today. And then they do a kind of uh, exercise in the final week where they learn a bit of data and they learn how to kind of estimate the impact of their own presence on the outcomes that that we're studying. Um, so that's where the data comes from. This, uh, this study, uh, this study comes from a class. And so um, that means that we're going to be kind of using two sets of data for the paper. The first is from kind of the original study before I graduated from grad school and I started uh, teaching this class. And so that's from this firm census and baseline as part of my dissertation work in, in 2014. Uh, where we're going to kind of pull in things like the owner's gender, age, marital status, education, ethnicity, cognitive ability. Uh, we're also going to have firm indicators like the, the, the length the, the firm has been open. This is our most recent measure of firm size and kind of baseline profits. In 2018 and, and 2019, uh, which are kind of the two uh, rounds for the, the main panel of interest, this is we get other hits on firm profits. We have measures of household liquidity and household size, which are kind of our key explanatory variables of interest in the panel study. 
uh, we we also do a real bargaining exercise that's going to pull out bargaining data, which I'm about to talk about, such as order completion, first price, final price, and kind of the number of rounds that that happened during the bargaining exercise. We also have quality assessments for every garment that was completed in both years that we're going to use to kind of uh, check for kind of time varying uh, drivers of, of this relationship uh, between her uh, personal liquidity and, and final price. And lastly, uh, the uh, we're we're gonna only in 2019 we add this kind of lab in the field experiment as the as the final activity of, of data collection where we play this bargaining game with the um, with the respondents. And we'll also in that bargaining game have first price, final price, and number of rounds, but not order completion because there's no order being completed. So just a, a note about sampling. So because this is, you know, data that's collected as part of an NYU class, we are only in the field for a few days. So um, the firms in operation throughout the course of the study were 375, but those that we were actually able to reach in the short period of time that we were in the district are 282. We anticipated that we wouldn't have enough time to reach everybody and, um, and so in order to kind of make sure that this was effectively a random sample, we randomized the priority uh, uh, with which we, we surveyed respondents. So a few respondents are dropped because we, we ran out of time to reach them, but, but other respondents might be dropped because they just weren't in the district during the time that, that, we, uh, that we were there. And effectively what we achieve is, you know, effectively we, we conducted these surveys and did this experiment and did this bargaining activity over like two days per year. So people are kind of more or less balanced across day one and day two. And they're also balanced on whether or not they're um, attrited from the ultimate sample of those who complete the order, which is 229, which is the, the main sample of interest for the, for the panel analysis. So the real bargaining exercise is the first activity that we would do every year. and and we were kind of managing, you know, in designing how we were going to do the bargaining exercise, we were kind of managing uh, surveyor effects and artificiality against trying to control this as almost like a, you know, a, a data elicitation process. So the way that we decided to do this is we had the enumerators memorize a script where the script really was, they, they could add a bit of their own style because if you've ever been to Ghana, people people have a style with uh, their an own personal style with the way they bargain and you know my I have like you know a, a petite quiet surveyor Eva who's not gonna um you know bargain in the same style as my you know kind of more gregarious larger surveyor uh Kwame and so they're gonna have different styles and I don't want to like inhibit their styles I don't want them to feel like a robot but what we do want them to do is we want them to hit particular price points, counter price points, where they, you know, effectively, whatever the respondent throws out, they'll throw out exactly the same price. So they'll they'll hit the same mark, but they might have different uh, different styles in, in the in the way that they in the in the way that they hit those hit those marks. Um, in particular, uh, I'm just going to show you. So, so this is the, the paper survey that we use to kind of uh, have them memorize, uh, you know, the example script. So, so these were kind of like covering the, the main things that we wanted them to, to hit upon. So now I would like to discuss the possibility of making a purchase for you today. New York University is interested in purchasing some children's clothes. Specifically, we would like you to sew for us a child's shirt. I would need this garment made no later than Friday morning. I leave town on Friday morning and cannot connect the shirt and make the payment after this time. Uh, this is where, you know, if you look back um, at, you know, the 282 to 229, a bunch of people didn't enter into the bargaining process because, you know, just it's a short window, like it's rush order, uh, 24 hours notice or 48 hours notice. So some people just literally couldn't take on uh, the order. And so we had some people drop out. But if you do enter into the bargaining process, I think there were only two people that we walked away from here. So, um, this is how you, you kind of start out. They, they try and coax out an initial price from the seller. Then they would kind of counter depending on what that price was with a, a counter offer for whatever price the, the seller had had set out. And then um, the the final price would be kind of noted if uh, if it was ended up being less than or equal to 30 Ghana CDs. But if the garment maker didn't come down at the final stage of bargaining to below 30 Ghana CDs, we would, we would walk away. 
Um, Morgan, there's a couple of questions. Um, okay. So firstly from um, Chris, if now's a good time. Okay, yeah. So uh, thanks. Um, so Morgan, can, what can you tell us about sort of the normal relationship between customers and buyers? So this is obviously yeah. sort of a new customer, but typically with these buyers, do people go back to the same, uh, yeah. you know, tailor every time when they buy stuff? So I get these sort of thicker relationships. Yeah. And then how do I think about what you're doing in the context of that? Yes, we have a little, it's a little bit of a can of worms. So I have from this context, a market research survey that I collected for some other studies. So I know that um, in this market, there are a lot of repeat customers, but customers do also switch around. And uh, the number one reason that customers switch actually isn't price, uh, which doesn't, that might just be like, I, I wouldn't overinterpret that because just in equilibrium, it could just be that everybody's setting similar prices or whatever, but like the it's style. So like if I, you don't have a style that I want, I'll, I'll move. But, um, but there is kind of customer diversion. It's not like you go to the same person every single time, but it is, but it is sticky and price is a factor that, that is considered for customers and in, in whether or not they'll switch garment makers. Does that, does that help? But yeah, I think, I think what you're trying to get at is that, you know, NYU is, is a different kind of, uh, customer than um than like a, a local person that that you have more information about or that you expect to um yeah Is that so what you mean? so so i guess yeah. i i guess i had this question uh i had my hand up earlier to ask this question even before i saw that yeah. it was nyu that was buying the yeah. particular garment so and i and i i guess what you said about you know, I, I move around if I'm trying to figure out what the friction is in the market that'll that gives the the seller some some uh, bargaining room here to begin with. Yeah. So the fact so that I I'm think, moving yeah. to a style that you don't have the particular style I want does does then give you some, you know, the, yeah, but that's I the kind of thing point. I'd like to understand yeah. more about. That's mm -hmm. that's all. Yeah, I actually think that so this kind of goes to um, what I might start pontificating about a bit more on my concluding slide, where I think like there's a, I, I feel like this paper leaves me with a lot of questions and like an interest in kind of the market structure is one of them. And I have some things that I can say about that because of like a bunch of data that I collected in this context. But I feel like this study is not gonna be one that's gonna like answer all the puzzles of this market structure and how it's kind of relates to a bit what Simon was saying about how I, I, I feel like the way I'm thinking about this is like, this is the first time that I'm trying to like take seriously at least considering price and then once you start considering price yeah all these other questions come where you're like okay well like what kind of market structure is this and and I guess like what what I what I would say anecdotally and from my market research is this is not a perfectly competitive market for sure like customers uh you know I I, I don't I there is a bit of kind of I guess like it's it's like a I don't know what it, like a soft monopoly in some ways where you're right like some people have like a style that I want or there's also kind of some imperfect information here where like there's a bit of search, like customer search, right? It's not like I can easily see that somebody's gonna make me a high quality garment right away. I don't know how their timing's gonna be. So there's a bit of learning about the supplier in this context. So I feel like there's there there are quite a there are quite a few things that you need to think about when trying to characterize exactly why there's leeway and kind of the prices that are set. But I think if you take all of the, like, given that there is some leeway, I think what we're finding here is that a strong predictor of that price is the personal characteristics of the firm owner themselves, in particular, like their personal and household liquidity outside of their business situation, which is, which is the kind of facts that, that we find particularly compelling here. Um, Kate Orkin also has a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, I know it, it introduces an additional layer of complexity, but I was wondering what was behind the decision just to do one unit, because um, it, um, you know, often it seems like uh, people will make different decisions depending uh, about whether to sell a good, depending on whether they're selling one unit or like many units. So you might yeah. agree no, yeah, to cool. sell at a lower yeah. price if you're selling more than yeah. one unit. So it may be something yeah. to qualify. I know you can't can't change it now. No, that's cool. Maybe. Yeah, I think that would be cool for like a follow-up study. I think the main reason that we did one unit is that with the exception of a small grant that that Gisela was able to get from Vassar, the vast majority of this field work was paid for out of like the NYU class budget. And so like it was, you know, it's expensive. Like if you think of the number of, of garments that we're buying, it's just, it would be, you know, that and, and also I would think uh, 
power becomes an issue, but we do have previous work where we randomize, rather we fix the price and we randomize the number and we have some other papers that, that we've written about that. But uh, yeah, so I kind of, it's like budget logistics and also kind of power, I'd say, but I agree. I think that would be, that would be a really cool, I feel like there's a lot of really cool next steps that somebody could take after kind of, this paper leaves a lot to be studied is what I would say. But I think the reason we're excited about it is it's kind of like a, you know, it's like a teaser paper to try and get people excited about these possible directions that that they might take this. Yeah, but I agree. I think that would be really cool. Somebody else should do that or maybe me someday. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I don't see any others. I think that's okay. awesome. Cool. Um, let me just time check. I want to make sure that I'm moving fast. I have no way of seeing the time. Oh, wait, here we go. Perfect. Okay, cool. I'm going to speed up because I I'm being too conversational. I, I set the slides for less interruptions. But I really like those directions. So I'll manage my time, don't worry. So, okay, so this is the script. Uh, just to, a quick uh, kind of flag on the endowment measure. So, so the endowment measure is household liquidity per capita and the kind of the main text I wanna show you guys as part of the survey. This is the key explanatory variable of interest in the, in the bargaining panel. If you urgently needed money for your family, example, a child's education or someone becomes ill, how much cash can you collect in a week? Please include all sources, including your own savings, money you can get from other members of your household, money you can borrow from family, friends, and the bank or similar institution. So this is like our definition of liquidity. And, and I think it's important to kind of look at all of the different inputs that go into liquidity, particularly for when we show you our results and how they change with things like firm owner fixed effect um, to, to think about what can and, and can't be at play in, in, in some of our findings. And, and so just kind of to, to set uh, levels here, I, I might go a little quickly here, but so th this is kind of the, the main outcomes of interest and the main uh, uh, kind of level of the household personal liquidity just uh, So this is in Ghana CDs. You could divide this by, I'm blinking right now on this. I think it's like about four. I'm sorry, guys, I should have thought of that. But yeah, it's, it's about four to get it to US dollars. But, but you can kind of see that the, the prices uh, go up between 2018 and 2019. We actually like anecdotally think that has to do with a little bit of information spread. Um, yeah, personal liquidity uh, is actually, um, personal liquidity per capita is also, also increasing. Uh, these are inflation adjusted, so this isn't um, because of inflation, but yeah, there's slight increases in, in all of these measures um, between 2018 and 2019. Uh, you can see that personal liquidity per capita, per capita on average is, is, is not, very high and it's approximately equal to kind of the the profits of the the firm owner in the last month uh so just to kind of set you know graphically kind of the the set of uh the the main findings that we're getting from the the bargaining panel so this is a a, a qfit plot uh uh with a confidence interval of just kind of the cross-sectional relationship between um household liquidity per capita and final price you can see that you know when you go from having zero household liquidity uh, per capita up to kind of the maximum, the price is increasing by by quite a bit, almost for Ghana CDs, uh, which, is a, which is a large amount. This also holds true if you look at differences. So if you look at kind of the change in personal liquidity, uh, per, sorry, household liquidity per capita across the years and kind of the change in the final price, you see this same, this same relationship occurring. Um, so we're going to uh, take this to kind of a regression framework. So uh, the basic regression then would be kind of why IT, which is uh, our bargaining outcomes, which is final price, first price, number of rounds. And then um, our main regressor of interest is this z-score of the household liquidity per capita, which means that we can interpret the coefficients as kind of one standard deviation increase in household liquidity per capita is associated with a certain increase in the y variable. We're also going to step in uh, control. So we'll first show you the kind of like raw relationship. Then we'll also show you just a vector of survey characteristics, like the year, the day of the survey, and in particular, whether a student was present. Then we'll show you a uh, regression with, with firm fixed effects, which should control for end, any time in varying observables or unobservables. Um, then we're gonna step in uh, some controls for kind of time varying personal and firm characteristics. And here, you could see these as kind of potential confounders, but also potential channels that might be changing the, the relationship, the pure relationship between um, household liquidity per capita and, and, um, and our outcomes of interest. Um, the standard errors are clustered at the firm level. 
Uh, just uh, these are just kind of to, to get in your mind ahead of showing you the results, the, the time varying characteristics that we're able to control for in the, in the final panel. So the things that we include in that final panel will be uh, the garment uh, business being the primary income of the firm owner. As you can see, it's basically true almost always. Uh, percent contribution to the household income. So on average, they're contributing about 50% to the total household income of their household. Uh, the ratio of wage earners within the household. So this is like, you know, slightly, it, it's around a, a, a third or a third to, to kind of 40% of, of, uh, of uh, households, uh, household members are, are wage earners. Uh, that's, I think it's only adults, but um, I have to check with Gisela for that. Um, household income per capita is, uh, is uh, the total income in a, a, the, the firm profits expected next week, firm profits last month, number of orders in the last seven days, um, number of orders possible in the next seven days is kind of a, a measure of, of capacity, uh, total expenses in the last seven days, price that you think others are charging. For us, we were thinking that's something about price information, and then last but not least, kind of the quality of the garments that they're creating across these years. So these are all things that you might worry are both confounders, but you might also find them interesting as, as potential channels. And we're not really taking a, a strong stance on that, but we'll just kind of show you the, the results. So the first column, as we said, is, is just kind of the raw relationship. So this is pooling the two rounds together and adding no controls. What you see is that for the final price, a one standard deviation in household liquidity per capita is associated with 0.7 Ghana CDs increase in the final price. Uh, the first price is approximately the same magnitude, it's 0.8 Ghana CDs increase, and you have about a, a fifth of a round uh, increase in, um, in, in number of rounds of back and forth. And um, these are all uh, statistically significant estimates. Um, it, column two adds in survey controls and you, and you don't really see a ton of action there. Um, column three, we add in um, the, the firm fixed effects, which controls for time in varying observables and unobservables. And here we see a drop in uh, first price. And I just want to be, um, and you know, we, we see that that final price appears quite robust to this um, to this control, while, while first price does not, number of rounds does. So we, we find that interesting. We're actually still trying to think about why we see this. You might imagine that this is, um, because uh, first price is indeed driven by some time invariant endogenous unobservable, but it could also be a clue as to kind of the mechanism through which uh, personal liquidity per capita does impact first price as opposed to final price. And, I, and so we're not actually able to, to say which of that is the case. And then last but not least, when we include the time bearing controls, we see a slight drop that's not you know statistically different than column three but is a, a drop in, in magnitude, but is still, uh, we consider uh, economically significant and statistically significant of the, the final price. It, it drops to uh, just under 0.7 uh, Ghana CDs increase, 0.68. Uh, and uh, first price drops even further to, to 0.34 and, and number of rounds drops to, to 1.15, uh, 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 but is still statistically significant. And we see this as interesting as well, because this is a, a further clue. You know, I just listed for you the number of things that we're controlling for as to what might be going into uh, the variation that we see in, in um, household liquidity per capita. So in particular, just kind of review what, what I think we're seeing there and kind of what we're still puzzling over. So we're seeing this kind of robust and economically meaningful relationship between household liquidity and bargaining behavior. Um, the potential concerns that we express are time invariant um, unobservable, like, you know, things that we were brainstorming about were like patience or bargaining style driving this relationship with the exception of first price, which could be either like we're catching a potential bias there or su such that first price is actually not where the action is, or we could be picking up on some potential um, insight into the channels where, um, where final price is driven by changes while first price is driven by levels. And, and we're, we're not exactly sure what what to, to say there. Um, and also we kind of include some time invariant characteristics that we are able to measure, including firm owners' personal financial situation, there are some measures of their outside options, uh, firm productivity, production costs, price information, garment quality. Um, we, do, we see that, that, um, that these uh, 
these controls do not uh, attenuate uh, much the relationship between uh, between the bargaining behavior and, and household liquidity per capita. And I think this could be um, insights into to maybe what potential channels are, are left at play. And in particular, one of the things that we were thinking about that we don't have a good proxy of is, is you know, as we said originally, um, back when we introduced the measure, uh, you know, these, um, these, uh, uh, like these, these firm owners are, are, are cash poor, but, but they're, they're, you know, in, in this context, uh, a lot of, of personal liquidity comes from wealth and people and, and people kind of bail each other out for a lot of these situations. And so our, our running theory here is that this is where most of the, the action comes from on this personal liquidity per capita variable. Although, you know, it is, um, in uh in cross-section correlated with a lot of of you know our firm and, and personal characteristics as is um predictable given the 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 question that we ask um but uh one key remaining concern is this idea of, of opportunity cost which is something that that is hard for us to to really rule out um no matter what we throw at the observational panel data and so this was kind of the motivation for adding on this um lab in the field experiment so the way that we did the lab in the field experiment, and I'll try and speed up a little bit because I'm, I'm running low on time, is uh, so we said now we're going to play some games during which you can earn some real cash. Uh, we randomized the liquidity shock of, uh, of an amount between 25 and, and 5 gonocides. This is balanced on observables. To begin these games, you will receive an initial amount of cash. This cash is yours to keep regardless of what happens. Um, or what you earn during the games. This amount is randomized endowment gonocides. Firm owners bargain with tablet over uh, the surplus division. The computer has been programmed to behave like a buyer, bargaining with you over the price of a garment. This game is being played for real money. If you and the computer are able to agree on a price, we will give you that money. So the, the pros here are that, you know, this is causal, and it also abstracts away from that pesky opportunity cost from the bargaining panel. I think the cons here are that this is even more artificial than the, the NYU bargaining exercise. But, um, but yeah, so just... Uh, yeah, so just uh, just uh, I'll I'll zoom over a little bit on the framing, but so this is just something that we use beans to um, to kind of make these prices salient and then allow them to kind of communicate with the tablet because a lot of our firm owners are are not literate, but then the the surveyor would kind of take the beans, they'd look at the tablet, they'd communicate back what the the computer was saying. Uh, here are our results. So um, what we see is that you know uh, on all days we see when we pull uh, both days together. We see uh, a point uh, nine to uh, Ghana CD increase uh, in uh, the final price gotten from the computer in the bargaining exercise when we move from the five Ghana CD endowment to the twenty five Ghana CD endowment. This is much much stronger on day one. Uh, this is uh, this is what we 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 believe that's that's due to spillovers. I'll cover that a little bit on the on the next slide. We also see uh, the same kind of pattern that we see in the panel data for um, first price and number of rounds. Uh, in particular, uh, the the first price <clears throat> the, the the first price is um, is uh, is is me is entirely driven by 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 day one. Uh, this is just a, a kind of figure to show you kind of the level and the and the confidence interval. Uh, of kind of day one versus day two. So you can kind of see the way that this is playing out. Uh, we think that that the fact that the price kind of rises to kind of the higher level of what was being gotten on day one is evidence of the fact that that between day one and day two, information spread throughout um, the sample on kind of this weird bargaining computer game. And, and people were talking, it was exciting and people were talking about what price they got. And, and I think that the, the highest Price getter might have revealed to everybody else what the what the computer's uh, reservation price was. Um, so, so I think that that we consider kind of day two to be a failed experiment. And and you can see that the um, you know because of what I mentioned earlier on that the that the uh, that these uh, that these uh, uh, that, that that we randomize the priority with which we interacted with respondents. The, the the observables are balanced on day one and day two. So effectively, these are two random samples between day one and day two. So just to, 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 to kind of quickly review the summary of the empirical findings. So I showed you a real bargaining exercise uh, in which there was one standard deviation increase in the firm owner's household liquidity was associated with about a 5% increase in the final price agreed upon, which we see as economically meaningful. 
Uh, in the bargaining experiment, we randomize the liquidity shock and we see that increasing liquidity from five, uh, from five kind of CDs 25 kind of CDs causes a 13% increase in the final price garner from the tablet game. Price converts on the second day, losing their effect. We believe we should spill over. So in the last, um, oh man, sorry, I'm running a little low on time, but um, I'll try and uh, if, if it's possible, because I answered a few questions, maybe I'll I'll just take two more minutes, Emma, if that's okay. But um, yeah. okay, perfect, awesome. So uh, potential mechanisms. Uh, so so so. Uh, the next thing that we do uh, in our study in our paper is we try and think, okay, so like, why would we see that sellers with a higher initial endowment ask for and receive higher prices than sellers with a lower endowment for the same goods? And a natural intuition that we see kind of arising here is that, you know, these are non-risk neutral firms. So firms are often modeled as profit maximizing and risk neutral while human households are modeled as risk averse. And in the context of micro enterprises in developing countries, firms are closely connected to households. And so in particular, what we do is we extend kind of this classic Nash bargaining solution, which, you know, just kind of for those that aren't familiar, because, you know, I wasn't before writing this paper, uh, Nash bargaining solutions, the, effectively the, the solution maximizes the product of the, the kind of gain utility between both players, between kind of what they would get if there were disagreement and, and what they get if there is an agreement. And so this is kind of the, the solution to the problem. And so in the case of our price negotiation, effectively what this is, is I can use my cursor. Um, so, so yeah, so like, let's suppose that the, the, the seller is risk neutral, they would get P and let's just assume that their, their outside option for, for the simple example is zero. And this is a risk neutral buyer, buyer, they would get value minus P and their outside option is zero. Then this is a really simple solution. So you maximize P of the product of these two things and you get, P star equals B over two. And this would be kind of the solution of a basic game. If you add endowment without adding risk neutral preferences, effectively what happens is now their valuation is P plus W and their outside option is W where W is endowment. So they get it either way. This falls out of this maximization problem, right? Because if it's risk neutral, it, it doesn't bite, right? So, so P star is not dependent on endowment. With, with non risk uh, with risk neutral preferences but as soon as you add kind of non risk neutral preferences for example CRRA preferences now these are more complex utility functions that are convex with respect to W and it doesn't fall out of the of the maximization problem anymore and now P star is a function of both Sigma which is the measure of relative risk aversion and the endowment and in particular you know this is this is difficult to solve with arithmetic but here's like a graph solution for different relative risk aversion parameters what you see is this is a risk neutral solution of endowment on price and then as the the firm owner becomes more uh risk averse you start to see a stronger and stronger relationship between endowment and price in this kind of basic bargaining model the key intuition here is just that there are more gains from trade in terms of utility for poor sellers. So for, for sellers with lower liquidity, with lower endowment. So non-risk producers seller endowment almost like puts a finger on the scale and lower endowment sellers act more risk averse because they have more to gain from any transaction relative to a high endowment seller. So just two slides on conclusion and then we can go to the discussion and apologies for running over by two minutes. So just to review and kind of set some caveats. So, so this paper kind of provides empirical evidence that household liquidity predict micro entrepreneurs bargaining behavior in an economically meaningful and statistically significant way. It's robust to a multiple a multitude of controls and research designs. And this is something that we think is hard to get at, which is why we've done it in two different ways. And we're hoping that we can kind of both way, both research designs can kind of simultaneously appease concerns that each other cannot, cannot appease. Uh, the intuition is really um, stemming from a very simple extension of the classic Nash bargaining solution um, in which less endowed non-risk neutral sellers have more to lose from a bargaining breakdown. Uh, two notes that we wanted to, to make here, we're trying to figure out how to put these in the paper is one is just that the insight may apply to any market where prices are set by sellers beforehand. You don't necessarily need this to be bargaining. And the other is that we want to make it clear we don't have an empirical stance here on mechanisms. We do have like a very simple way of showing this without much extension of theory. But you know there are other possible other possible theories you might have for for channels through which personal liquidity might drive uh, price, like aspirations or subsistence consumption. 
And finally, I just want to bring this back to some of the things that Chris and Simon were talking about. And this is the way we're trying to close this loop on this paper is that, you know, we kind of start with this motivation of like, do you got to have money to make money? What does this have to say about a, the potential for evidence of an intuition for poverty multipliers in strategic interactions in which low liquidity individuals may bargain their way into a lower surplus? And where we see this paper contributing is we're showing this relationship between liquidity, endowment, and prices. But we want to be clear that, that we can't show empirically, at least convincingly with our current data and design, a causal relationship between uh, prices and, and profits or, or endowment and profits. But we kind of take comfort in our ability to kind of converse with this existing literature in which they randomize uh, liquidity via this kind of loan flexibility and they do see this increase in profits. In particular, they focus on some channels like firms taking riskier investment decisions, but there is no existing evidence in that literature or a focus on pricing. And this is where we think our paper comes in. So our paper compels, in our opinion, a more serious consideration of how firm owners price their goods and services as a key potential barrier to microenterprise profitability and growth. And we're hopeful that um, other people will agree and kind of take up take up this agenda towards including um, pricing in as a, as a focus. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for running over by a minute or two. Thank you so much, um, Morgan. I think we already enjoyed um, your presentation, so thank you. Um, so we'll now go to um, questions, and I see Simon Quinn has his hand up. Should I keep my screen shared, or yeah, yeah, that would be great. Okay, sorry, let me reshare it. Oh, sorry, that's just our attrition table. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Thanks so much, Morgan. I had two questions, if that's right, or two comments. Yeah. One is just on this yeah. last slide. I mean, I agree that some very interesting special papers that you cite there do show that, but of course, the majority of the microfinance literature finds that increased liquidity brackets loans does not increase profits. Yeah. That doesn't dispute the point you're making, but these are special isolated points that's of, of contracts that seem to work, of course. Um, yeah. The other one is just to go back to the Nash yeah. bargaining solution. I had two comments mm -hmm. here. I yeah. mean, one is like Nash 53 is absolutely a general case of what you've written. Uh, yeah. And that's great. I think it's an advantage of what you've done. To me, this is an yeah. application of the Nash bargaining solution, yeah. not an extension yeah. of it, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. And the other Sorry, I'm, I'm not a theorist, so that's a good thing to be careful with. Okay. Yes, there's yeah. nothing about yeah. Nash. Okay. I, I agree with you. Only once you write V equals P do you impose uh, risk neutrality. Otherwise, it's absolutely uh -huh. captured by, by yeah. the original Nash concept. Yeah. And then the yeah. second one is just to say, so you go down one slide. Um, Sorry, which one, one more, where you see the CRA. Down. Next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just an observation, which is that if yeah. you solve this problem here, setting W equal to zero, mm -hmm. um, you will get a nice closed form tractable solution that shows that uh, a bargain, a player who is more risk averse will end up with a, a worse outcome from a Nash bargaining solution. Oh, I didn't think right? about that. And, and yeah, I take your you point that here, things become... Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but in the well, limit, it be, it's actually tractable. Sure. It looks like yeah, a no consumption problem. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. I see what you're saying. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. So that yeah, might be no. a nice way of fixing ideas. That's because really so I, I, yeah. I agree. I agree that you want to put the endowment in there because it matches yeah. your experiment very nicely. Yeah. But insofar yeah. as we think of uh, risk aversion, maybe proxying having more to lose, then yeah. you actually will get that before you even mm -hmm. go to that step and you'll get it in a tractable yeah. way. That's anyway. interesting. So we could almost flip the introduction of endowment. Yeah, I like that comment. Well, and just then to fix, your, fix readers' yeah. ideas, you could no, show no, a very no. simple yeah. post form there. Yeah, yeah Thanks I for like a super that. And then I wanted to, yeah, one other uh, comment I had, or maybe I'll, I'll save it for later, but yeah, I, I like the comment that you made about your right. This literature on kind of liquidity of loans is mixed. And I wonder whether we couldn't do a deeper dive into that and try and think about whether maybe it's related to, to what we were talking about, how like we can't close this loop and maybe in certain cases, this is a good thing and in other cases, it's a bad thing depending on how kind of price setting impacts like quantity and, and cost. But yeah, I mean, that's probably too far of a stretch. I don't want to pontificate too much, but I, I like that flag and I want to think about it more. Um, sorry, should I should I call on people, Emma, or you're going to call on people? No, no, I'll, I'll, I can oh, keep calling okay. on yeah. um, So next we had um, Hannah Burkel. I, I don't know, Hannah, if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask a question live. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. I'm not sure if you can hear me because my microphone is a bit bad, but um, I can hear you. I, 
My question is related to um, you mostly studying female garment entrepreneurs, if I understood mm -hmm. correctly. And I wonder uh, how applicable um, your results would be if you studied mostly male entrepreneurs. And yeah. also if you studied other types of manufacturing firms. Yeah, so we do have both men and women in the sample. And I wonder, I know that we looked at heterogeneity by gender and I can't remember what we found, but we definitely looked at it because Gisela and I are super interested in gender differences. I don't know if Gisela remembers, but but yeah. Uh, yeah, I th and I think that, uh, yeah, you can go ahead, Gisela, I saw you yeah. unmuted yourself then. I'll just yeah. answer that really quickly. Yeah, so we see the same patterns for men and women who, okay. um, yeah, in this that's what I thought. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that's why we don't report on student guidance. <laughs> so like, yeah, that's, um, yeah, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but then with respect to whether you would see the same things in like other manufacturing contexts, I, I'd be interested in kind of having a broader discussion about that, but I'd imagine there might be uh, some context where you might see something different, but in particular, like the lab experiment and the field results, uh, I think are, are, are kind of speaking to something maybe about human behavior. And then I think, you know, with respect to the, the bargaining panel, I, I mean, obviously replication studies would be great, but but, you know, as long as the firm owner is kind of setting their own prices and bargaining over goods and services where their kind of main input is labor, then I don't know, I'd be interested in kind of examples where we might be worried about extrapolating and then we can kind of engage with those. Yeah. Uh, next we have Mohammed. Hi, Morgan. Um, fascinating paper. Thank you very much. And especially this bit about uh, the possibility for kind of riskier investment behavior um, taking place through the price bargaining. Um, I just had a question, it's a really minor point, kind of similar theme to Kate's question about how, how these uh, transactions generally take place, say outside yeah. of this setting. Um, is like trade credit a part of how people bargain about uh, price and, and, and like that, that kind of thing? Because you can imagine bargaining yeah. about the price itself, but also saying, okay, listen, fine. You know, if you give it to me on credit then the price yeah. is slightly different, it's just, just anecdotally, I wondered whether. It yeah, was so anecdotally, I think that sometimes, yeah. So for for like a new buyer, uh, typically like you have to pay like normal, but it is true like longstanding customers sometimes will get credit. And you actually reminded me of another result that's in. I'm forgetting which of these liquidity loan papers it is, but they actually see an impact on that in one of these contexts where where um. They don't have price information, but they do see that that firm owners are more likely to kind of sell on credit to their customers. And um, yeah, and so that's that's an interesting thing to bring up and think about. Gisela and Lena are taking notes, by the way. I'm 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 not just like ignoring everybody's comments. They're all really interesting. Yeah, I like that comment a lot. Thank you. Uh, great. So next is Victor. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, I think I had just one question on uh, to what extent you think your results are really due to the type of firms you are studying, and in particular whether the I mean the purchase you are making uh, represents a large share of this firm's activity, and if you think, for example, uh, yeah, whether yeah. it's like they have like to buy, they make one product per day and yes or no they are making the product with you or not or whether mm -hmm. and whether you think your results would be valid with other types of firms which are selling a lot of different products every day yeah so I, what i can say about that so it's a little similar to one of the questions that was asked before so i think the lab and the field experimental results are kind of about the human being rather than the firm owner per se the panel data we have kind of controls that we put in in that final column for things like how many other orders are you making this week? Um, you know, how many orders could you make in the next week? So, so we, um, and so I, I guess I, I'm trying to think through what that means for, for your question. I, I wanna just flag that for your own mind too, in case that, that spikes something. But, but yeah, I think that, that it is an interesting question to think, would we see kind of bigger, smaller magnitudes of the relationship that we're picking up between liquidity and price, dependent on whether the firm were like kind of more or less, I guess, desperate for work. I, I, I have to think through how to do that in a way that would be like empirically convincing, but, but I think that's really interesting and we do have some data on that, so yeah. Good, and then we have Kate. Um, 
Thank this is a super interesting paper. Um, I, I get, had a question and a comment. The the on the question, I was wondering about um the way that you you chosen to operationalize the idea of an endowment, um yeah. because it seemed to me that it was um the particular survey measure that you'd used was uh, less about um a kind of uh, asset endowment or capital stock or or anything like that, and more about it, the ability to respond to shocks. Um, and I wondered. Yeah. If, yeah, I wondered if uh, the finding was yeah. robust across different asset measures, that might be something that it would be um, good to show. Um, yeah. yeah, so we have, um, so the things that we have is because, uh, so, so we don't, the, um, yeah, hold on, let me just find this slide where we talk about this. So this is the measure. So, um, so yeah, I think the reason that we chose this measure is because you, you have kind of like, you could have tried to go more directly for like you know wealth like kind of cash in hand and we do have in in 2019 we added a direct measure of like of this personal liquidity how much is like your own household personal savings that you have in hand uh, we don't we we do see the same cross-sectional relationship we can't test for the the time invariant characteristic robustness because we didn't collect it in in 2018 but, but I think the reason that we originally didn't think about it that way is because these are such like cash poor households, like so much of their wealth is held in wealth and people. So we felt like this was the more kind of the more relevant measure of wealth for, for these individuals. But, but yeah, based on kind of feedback we got from, from 2018, because originally we like kind of wrote up this paper with just the 2018 data and then people were like, this is cross-sectional, there's no experiment. And so that's why we went back in 2019 to like get the second hit and do the lab experiment. And, and, um, and then we added savings and yeah, we do see that it, it hasn't like survived into the main body of the paper because it's, we only have cross-sectional findings, but, but we see the same thing. And, and, and in a way it's like the reason we, we led with this one is what I was saying about how like we really think wealth and people here is like is is the main wealth measure of, of these individuals. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I think the the sort of counter thing asset to saving is like a, a major way you would yeah. deal with with this sort of shock. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think and, it and, it, you know, it might be nice just to have both. Are kind of I guess the illiquid assets like your house. I guess we we don't have a measure of here, and we don't really look at that. Um, yeah, so I guess, but but this encounter, this encompasses this personal liquidity per capita does encompass at least liquid wealth, you know. But yeah, yeah. I see, I see your point. I guess I, I would imagine my instinct would be that like when your kid's hungry, your house isn't that useful to you, um, or when your kid is sick or whatever. Like I think that savings under the mattress is probably useful to you, and then kind of your neighbors and your auntie and your uncle and and whatever is probably the most useful to you. So, but but yeah, I, I think. That's a good point. I think we, we should make a note to kind of add a bit of discussion. It's a bit hard. There's a word limit with, with AER Insights. We have 6,000 words. So this is another reason we're trying to kind of pick and choose what to put into the paper. But these are all really helpful comments for us to think about like where to put what and, and what to touch on. And so this is, thank you. This is helpful. So thank you so much, um, Morgan. I think we're just out of time now. Um, so thank you, Morgan, and, and thank you also, um, Gizala and uh, Lina, for, for joining today in the in the panel. Um, we really enjoyed your presentation, and um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, and then I just wanted to um, remind everyone that, that we continue with our CSC development uh, webinars next week, where we have um, Matteo Boba from Toulouse School of Economics, who's going to be presenting teacher compensation and structural inequality evidence from centralized teacher school choice in Peru. So please um, join us again uh, next week. And, and thank you again, Morgan. Thank you, everyone. This was incredibly helpful. I'm really grateful for, for everybody. So thank you so much.